Good day, great job learners. Welcome to today's business studies lesson. This lesson is brought to you by Gauden Department of Education in partnership with Saipono Discovery Center, broadcasted by Parama Research and Development. Today we look into the main topic we call business venture. And the subtopic we look into is investment insurance. So we will be focusing on insurance because it's very key for businesses to 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 know about insurance hence now the knowledge has to be shared now lesson objectives this is what you should understand at the end of this lesson and you should be able to do the following during the exam so that you can say you are ready for the exam so you should be able to elaborate on the meaning of non-compulsory insurance because insurance has compulsory and the non-compulsory one. So the compulsory one applies to two businesses, but when you're looking into non-compulsory as well, it also does apply to businesses. So we'll be looking into aspects of non-compulsory insurance and we'll look into the meaning of insurance to say what do we mean with the term insurance and we will define the meaning of the following insurance concepts, which is over insurance, under insurance, average loss, reinstatement, and excess. Then we'll look into explaining the differences between over and under insurance, then differentiate between insurance and assurance, and give examples for each. Then we'll also proceed by naming or giving examples of short term and long term insurance. Then we continue our lesson by discussing the following principles of insurance, the principle of indemnity or indemnification, the principle of security or certainty. We'll also look into the principle we call utmost good faith and the principle we call insurable interest and proceed by explaining the advantages or importance of insurance for businesses. Then look into explaining the meaning of insurable or non-insurable risks. And then outline or mention or give examples of insurable and non-insurable risks. Then proceed to your compulsory insurance. And then under your compulsory insurance, you should be able to elaborate on the meaning of compulsory insurance, then differentiate between compulsory and non-compulsory insurance, and continue by discussing three types of compulsory insurance, and then look into one type of in, uh, compulsory insurance, which is uh, UIF, Unemployment Insurance Fund, and look into types of benefits that are offered or paid out by the Unemployment Insurance Fund. Terminology that is important for this lesson is the term insurer. What do we mean by insurer? An insurer refers to now an insurance company that will take over the specified risks. That is the insurance company. For an example, your budget, your sunlam, your 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 your, your first for women, all those are insurance companies and they take over a specified risk. And then we, we have the insured, which can refer to individuals or businesses that take out insurance cover. So the insurer is the insurance company and the insured refers to the person or the business that is covered by the insurance. Then we have the term indemnity, which is very key for insurance uh, to indemnify is to compensate, protect or to repay the insured in an event of a loss or damage. Then we also have risk. Uh, risk refers to possibility of losses or damages. And then we have premium. Premium refers to the payment made by the insured to be covered in the event of losses or damages. Then we have stipulation tips. Stipulation refers to a condition or requirement that is specified or demanded as part of an agreement. So, that is your terminology for insurance. And as we proceed with our terminology, we also explain what is to, to indemnify. We dealt with that risk and loss. Then we also have unemployment insurance fund. This is the fund which provides benefits to workers who have been working and are now unemployed for reasons such as retrenchment. Then we have road accident fund. This is a fund which pays compensation. Remember to compensate now it is to basically replace. So these funds will compensate or it's a compensation when a person is disabled or injured in a road accident. 
and then it, it is focused on now again to the dependence of the individual who might be killed in a road accident then we have compensation for occupational injuries and disease so basically from your unemployment insurance fund to road accident and compensation we consider those three to be compulsory insurance now compensation for occupational injuries and disease act this one now focuses more on the business. This fund compensates workers financially for disability that may arise as a result of accident while performing their duties in the workplace. So that is your compensation for uh, occupational injuries and disease. Now, let's look into the meaning of insurance. Insurance covers a possible event. That's it very key a possible event so when we are saying a possible event we are looking into the, the idea that it may or may not happen so insurance will cover a possible event that may cause a specified loss meaning you specify which losses you want to be covered for as the insured and then the insurance company then would cover you for those specified losses for example when we are looking into uh, insurance of a car a car owner would specify that can i be insured for theft can i be insured for hijacking can i be insured for a possible car accident so those are events that can be covered by the insurance because those events can lead to loss or damage of the car so that is your insurance again it is an agreement whereby the insurer undertakes to indemnify the insured in an event of a specified loss or damage remember the loss has to be specified is it theft is it hijacking is it a, a car accident so those are your specified losses then the insured has to pay a premium for the specified losses or damages covered so a premium basically is a way in which the insured would confirm to say i'm being covered for the following specified losses so the premium has to be paid on a monthly basis by the insured so that they get to be covered by the insurance company why because now this is a contract between a person business or the insured requiring insurance cover and the insurance company insuring or the insurer bearing the financial risk so why is the insured paying the premium to transfer the risk of the loss to the insurance company so that if any loss happens then the insurance company would have to take the financial risk so if it happens now that the car is involved in a car accident, the damages to fix the car would be taken by the insurance company if there is an individual who's covered. Remember that large businesses have cars, large businesses have stock that they have to insure. So if maybe the stock in a warehouse catches fire, it has to be insured so that the business can be able to get another stock and they continue operating. So basically an insurance is there to take the financial risk from the owner of the asset to itself so that they solve the matter if it happens. Then, remember that insurance company now serves as a protection. As you see there, you have a face mask, which now was created uh, maybe due to, to, to COVID. And remember that when you were wearing a face mask during COVID, when you're wearing your face mask it represents now protection from COVID. so basically insurance becomes protection for uh, individuals or for businesses who have required cover and this is protection from any financial risk that may result because of a specified loss or damage now the meaning of non-compulsory insurance we should understand learners that insurance is not compulsory so when we are saying non-compulsory, we are specifying that businesses can take or can choose not to take the insurance. So that is your non-compulsory. Non-compulsory insurance is voluntary, meaning the business can choose not to take that insurance. So 
it means now the insured has a choice whether to enter into an insurance contract or not to enter. Then it is not required by law. It is not required by law, but the advantage is that it can provide protection for businesses and individuals. So that is your non-compulsory insurance. It is taken out in order to transfer the risk to the insurance company. So what are we looking into when we are talking about non-compulsory insurance? Non-compulsory insurance is divided into two. It is insurance that can cover one short-term insurance such as fire, theft, uh, maybe uh, theft damages, hijacking, so burglary are considered to be short-term insurance. So basically, it is not compulsory for a business to make sure that they cover themselves against fire, they cover themselves against theft of stock. So it is not compulsory. It is not required by the law. Again, long-term insurance, it is now insurance that focuses on retirement or debt. It is not compulsory for an individual to take such cover it is not required by the law that's what we mean when we are looking into non-compulsory insurance and the sources of non-compulsory insurance can be short term which can be cover for fire or theft or cover for retirement and that if we consider long term hoping we understand each other now we look into insurance concepts. These are concepts that are used by insurance companies to calculate maybe how much one would be paid. And remember that during uh, the process of being insured, there are other aspects like the value or the market value of the asset to say if it happens now that the market value is lesser than the insurance amount, how can the insurance company deal with that? If it happens that maybe you have been insured for more than the actual market value how can the insurance deal with that so uh, i will be looking into ways in which a business would be able to know how the maybe insurance company can deal with such matters so we have the term over insurance and under insurance we should understand now these are concepts that specify a situation that an individual can face so an individual for instance can be over insured or an individual can be under insured so we'll explain to say when now an individual is over insured how can the insurance company deal with that and when the individual is under insured how can a, a insurance company deal with that as well and then we also have average loss and reinstatement now which are, are ways in which or clauses that deal now with the different situations that i talked about which is your over insurance and under insurance so you should know that when a business is over insured Basically, the, 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 the insurance company would have to apply reinstatement. And when a business is underinsured, a business, a, 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 the insurance company would have to use average loss. So we'll talk about that as we proceed. And then when it comes to the process of claiming for these two lines, you would have to pay access so that your claim can be uh, uh, approved so over insurance and under insurance are situations which can now have or cause problems however those problems are managed using the stipulations the first one is average loss then we have reinstatement to deal with your over insurance if a customer is over insured how will the insurance company deal with that remember i said reinstatement if a customer is under insured how will the insurance company deal with that they would use average loss and this one would require a calculations calculations but our uh, reinstatement those are just laws to say if one is over insured we just reinstate them return them to the same financial position before the occurrence of the loss but before all that can happen uh, the insured has to pay excess so those are insurance concepts which help now to make it easy for the client and make it easy for the insurance company to be able to work together then Let's start with the first one or the first situation can be over insurance. What do we mean when we say someone is over insured? Over insurance is when the item is insured for more than the actual market value. That is over insurance. So what do we mean by that? When we are talking about the market value, let me break it down. The market value refers to the price the price at which the asset can be sold for 
that is the market value. So when we are saying over insurance is when the item is insured for more, for more than the actual market value. So it means the item, the asset, let's say the asset is 200,000. So if the asset is 200,000, when we are talking about over insurance, we are saying the customer or the client now, the client has taken insurance for 300,000. So it meaning the car, if we are to use a car, let's say the car at market value, meaning at the price at which it can be sold, the car can be sold for 200,000. But the client is paying insurance for 300,000, which now is not equivalent to the market value of that particular car. So we consider this situation whereby the client is paying more for the insurance of uh, the car. We consider that to be over insurance because the client was supposed to be paying 200 thousand but the client is paying three hundred thousand so that is over insurance then the business will not receive a payout larger than the value of the loss at market value so this means if there is damage to maybe a car of a business the business will not receive more for the loss that has occurred because the understanding from the client meaning now the business the business would say because we were paying insurance for three hundred thousand and our our business car was stolen or our van was stolen and it was worth two hundred thousand and we were paying insurance for three hundred thousand then we are expecting to get three hundred thousand back so then the insurance or the law is saying now the business will will not receive a payout larger than the value of the loss at market value so the business will not receive more than 200,000 it will only receive 200,000 and nothing less then this means that the extra money paid for the premium will not be paid out to the insured if there is a claim for a loss so it means the the, the 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 client or the business will only receive two hundred thousand not more than that then this normally occurs with a, an asset or an item such as a car when you buy a car most of the time let's say this car is hundred and fifty thousand so the car is hundred and fifty but you should know that a car is an asset that loses value as it is being used. So the issue is that maybe they, the company might have taken insurance for a 150,000 car. But then as the car is being used, the car is losing value. So it means if the business continues, let's say insurance that is equivalent to 150,000 is 1.5 per month. So it means, let's say the business pays 1.5 for two years. So if they pay uh, 1,005 for two years, it means now if the car, after two years, the car is no longer 150,000. The car maybe might be 130 when we are looking into the market value of the car because the more you use the car, the more it loses value. So it means now the car is, the, the, the business would be over insured because they are paying 1,005, which is equivalent to 150,000 or which is equivalent to a car that is worth 150,000. So that can create maybe over insurance. We should be our and most of the time, as I said, it is uh, applicable to assets that lose value as they are being used. So if now there is a damage, over insurance states that a loss that would be used is reinstatement. So the car will not be now. They are saying the payout, the payout will not be larger than the value of the loss at market value. So what are we saying there? 
they are saying because we are paying the insurance per month of 1005 which is equivalent to a car that is worth 150 you will not receive 150 because you are paying 1005 which is equivalent to 150 or a 150 car you will only receive 130 because that is what the car is worth at market value so that's what they mean then we have under insurance what do we mean by under insurance it occurs when property or assets are not insured for their full market value so i repeat it occurs when property or assets are not insured for their full market value so basically here we are saying if a house because now with under insurance it happens now to uh, assets that appreciate value like a house like a house a house appreciates value so let's say you bought your house for five hundred thousand, for example that is i'll just leave it there and continue then the asset is insured for less than the its current value of the property or asset so basically we are saying you will be taking insurance or that is lesser than the value of the asset at the time so maybe you might be uh, paying insurance that is worth 400,000 but the logic is always the idea that when you take insurance for the first time you, there's no way an insurance company can allow you to pay less so what happens is that this house now would appreciate value let's say the value increases because when you say appreciate we are saying the value will increase so if the value increases the value may would increase to 700,000 and let's say the initial amount of insurance you were paying was for a house that is worth 500,000 and you are still paying the same insurance amount which might be maybe for instance 450 so 450 is equivalent to a house that is worth 500,000 but the house now has appreciated value and then the house now is 700,000 so we are saying because you are paying 450 450 is for a house that is worth 500,000 so it means you are underinsured because you are paying the insurance value of 450 the premium of 450 which is equivalent to your 500,000 house but the value of the house now is 700,000 so it means the amount you are paying of insurance is less so when we are to calculate you are underinsured and you are underinsured by how much when you are checking here 450 is equivalent to 500 which makes now the insurance to be underinsured by 200,000. So that's what we mean you are paying insurance that is lesser than the market value of the asset. So the asset is insured for less than its current value. Current value which is the price at which the asset can be sold for then if the business is insured for an amount that is under the actual market value remember market value the amount at which the asset can be sold for so if now the business is insured for an amount that is under the actual market value of the goods or services the business will only be paid out for the amount that the goods or assets are insured for so the insurance will have to calculate how much you are insured for and pay you for that amount now the insurer usually applies average laws to calculate the amount of loss that must be compensated to the insured so i said this most of the time applies to an, an asset such as property or a house because a uh, property appreciates value or increases in value so from five hundred thousand, when you initially bought the car to now the house is seven hundred thousand. so if the premium has not changed it means you are still covered for five hundred thousand so it means you are under insured so it means the insurance amount is five hundred thousand but the value or the market value of the house is seven hundred uh, seven hundred thousand so we can see seven hundred thousand is the value but the insurance amount is five hundred the insurance amount is five hundred thousand so that means you are under insured the insurance amount should be seven hundred thousand but the insurance amount is five hundred 
thousand instead so we will look now into the difference between under and over insurance over insurance property or assets are uh, insured for more than their value that is more because over more than their value while under insurance property or assets that are not insured for their full market value so that is under but with over for example if the asset with the a a stands for asset the asset maybe is three hundred thousand. when you're over insured if your insurance amount would be insurance a ia means insurance amount would be four hundred thousand. So this means you are overinsured because the asset at market value is 300,000 but the insurance amount you are paying is for 400,000. But when you are looking into under insurance, A, the asset is worth uh, 300,000 again. So when property or assets are not insured for their full market value, so the insurance amount IA, what is the IA there? Is 200 thousand so now this tells you that you are underinsured because the asset is worth three hundred thousand but your insurance amount is two hundred thousand so you are under insured then how will the insurance company deal with that the insurer can choose to reinstate the insured meaning when the insurer is choosing to reinstate it means the insurance amount or the insurer will choose to say we will not pay you four hundred thousand if there's any loss or damage that is worth uh three hundred thousand we will only return you to your three hundred thousand reinstate you return you to the same financial position before the occurrence of the loss then when we're looking into under insurance the insurer will implement the average loss to determine the amount that will be uh, paid so there the insurance company will have to calculate calculate how much you have to get in proportion to what you are covered for since you are covered for 200,000 we calculate to say what is a uh, 200,000 of the damages that you have in comparison with uh, the asset held then over insurance businesses will not receive a payout larger than the value of the loss at market value as i said you will not receive 400000 because the asset is 300000 but when you are looking into under insurance businesses will only be paid out for the amount of the goods or asset that is insured for so since you are insured for 200000 the insurance company will only pay in proportion to what you are covered for which is 200000 hence we need to calculate how much would be 200000 of the 300000 to be covered so that is your differences between over and under insurance and what you can see here is that um, the, the, these uh, issues of over and under insurance they protect the insurance company because the idea here is uh, and no one or no individual or business should profit from an insurance company then we have average loss which we talked about to say how will you now calculate so average loss is a stipulation set by the insurer is set by the insurer which is applicable when property or goods is for less than its market value so it means when now your property or assets are covered for less than its market value then the insurance company would have to apply this stipulation which is a requirement so the requirement now ensures that the insurance company would have to deal with the matter of under insurance which is now when uh, property or items or assets are insured for less than uh, their market value so they would have to deal with average loss how will they deal with this this means that the insured is responsible for part of the risk that is not insured for because remember we said property or the asset here would cost how much the asset maybe it, it, it would cost uh, 300,000 and the insurance amount insurance would be a uh, 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 200,000 I return to the same example so we'd have to calculate and the basically they are saying if any damage occurs the insurance uh, company will only cover damages for the amount insured for which is 200,000 furthermore 
Note, the average loss applies when goods or assets are underinsured. You should know, as I said, average loss will only be applicable when goods or assets are underinsured. So basically, let us look now to the formula on how to calculate average loss. And we'll be having an example, an example now which would help you maybe to, to, to be able to practice even for the exam. For example, we have Peter who owns a touched house which is valued at one million and he is is insured or he has insured his house with pro cover insurance for eight hundred thousand. so already you see the value of the house value of the house is one million but pro cover insurance has covered or peter is paying eight hundred thousand, which is lesser than the value so the insurance amount is eight hundred thousand. so a fire in the kitchen caused damage for 30,000. So since the damage is 30,000, we have to calculate to say how much would Peter be covered for. And the calculations would involve the insurance amount, which is 800,000, and the value, which is 1 million, together with the damage. So this is the formula for your insurance, which says amount insured over the value of the insured item multiplied by amount of what damages or loss. So you should always know with this formula that the amount insured should be lesser than the value of the insured item multiply by damages so immediately when you are calculating you see that the amount insured is more than the value of the insured item you know that you are going to get a wrong answer so make sure that you calculate properly so when we uh, now transfer that into the actual calculation say amount insured how much is the amount insured the amount insured there is eight hundred thousand so we would say eight hundred thousand over value of the insured item how much is the value now you go back to your scenario this would be during the exam it's important to underline when you're dealing with numbers so that you don't make mistakes and then you'd say this is one million and then you check again remember i said you should always make sure that the amount insured is lesser than the value of the insured item so when you check there how much is the amount insured eight hundred thousand how much is the value of the insured item is one million so which one is bigger the one that is bigger is the value of the uh, item so that is good so it means now your formula is correct multiply by now the amount of damages the damages that occurred there they amount to 30 thousand then you calculate to get how much would peter be paid by the insurance company so it means now we are calculating and the answer should not be over thirty thousand that is another tip your answer should not be over thirty thousand because remember peter is underinsured so it means peter will not be covered at full market value because peter was underinsured so your amount of damages or the cover that the insurance should uh, pay should not be over thirty thousand or should not be thirty thousand. It should be anything less. If you have maybe punched your calculator wrong, but you should know that it should be anything less. So the answer there, you'd have to punch in your calculator to say eight hundred thousand uh, divided by one million. Eight hundred thousand divided by one million multiply by the 30,000 the answer should be 24,000 so how will you confirm that the 24,000 is correct you check what are the damages the damages are 30 and what is how much will the, the insurance company pay 24,000 and how do you confirm that 24,000 can be correct is because now 24,000 is lesser than the damages because Peter was under insured so that is how they would determine the amount to be paid when a client or a business is under insured hoping you understood that one then we have reinstatement reinstatement it is a stipulation whereby the insurer may replace lost or damaged property or goods instead of reimbursing the insured so basically here we are talking about an over insured business or an over insured client to say if someone is over insured the stipulation applicable uh, applicable there is reinstatement which focuses on the idea that of replacing lost 
uh, property or lost uh, uh, assets. So the stipulation is applicable when property or goods are overinsured. So we should know that the reinstatement is there to deal with overinsured, overinsured clients, while average loss is there to deal with underinsured clients. Then the reinstatement value will not be higher than the market value of the loss. So here they specify that the reinstatement value will not be higher. So when you are over in short, remember, I have to give you an example again or remind you to say when you are over in short, we are saying now, for example, you have a house. When you are having a house, when you are over in short or when you are having a house, we are saying your house is 700,000. But you are paying insurance. For an 800,000 house for an 800,000 house. So it means your insurance is for an 800,000 house, but your house at market value is 700,000. So you are paying more. So the reinstatement value will not be higher than the market value of the law. So the insured is returned almost to the same financial position as before the loss occurred. It doesn't matter that you are overinsured. You will be returned to the same financial position before the occurrence of the loss that's what they mean so if your house if your house is seven hundred thousand you were over insured and you were paying what eight hundred thousand what they are saying is that if there is a damage to your house, the entire house, just say the entire house is damaged, it means you have lost your 700,000 house. So the insured is returned almost to the same financial position as before the loss occurred. So they are basically saying you will be returned to the same financial position. How much was your house? Your house at value was 700,000. So when they are reimbursing or when they are compensating you, the insurance company will only give you 700,000, which returns you to the same financial position. So this teaches you to say one day when you own a business or when you own an asset that is insured always check with the insurance company to say how much is the market value of your asset so that you are able to uh, pay the right amount that is equivalent to the asset that you are owning at market value so that you do not pay more or so that you don't pay less so that you don't find yourself over insured or under insured so that you avoid average loss which means you'll get less money when it comes to claiming and reinstatement which means you are paying more money but you will be compensated the amount that is equivalent to your market value so that is basically what these uh, concepts teach you about insurance and then access will be looking to the idea that this is now the process of claiming before one can claim if there's maybe a loss or damage to their asset so they need to pay access so access is a portion of the insurance claim that is insured which will have to be paid to us the cost of replacing or repairing the goods or property concerned that's one and then excess payments keeps the insurance premiums lower and they discourage fraud so that is your excess payments and furthermore the insurer needs to protect themselves from fraudulent claims because you know some clients might try to come up with uh, fraudulent claims therefore having to pay the excess payment are actually a good way to do this as the insured is less likely to submit false claim when he or she needs to pay an amount upfront. So that is an advantage to the insurance company. And then excess payments prevents the insured from claiming for minor damages that may happen to their asset. So the amount or size of excess is stipulated in the insurance policy and it is what basically uh, the insurer and the insured would agree to before the insurance cover can be accepted. And then an example of the excess payment, Sam's computer was insured for 6000 with an excess payment of 500 If it is stolen, the insurer paid out 6000 minus 500 meaning 
for Sam to get the new computer. So Sam would have to pay how much? 500. Hence, we say now the insurance company would have to pay 5.5. So this now makes sure that there's no fraudulent claims and it ensures that Sam will not maybe lose uh, his computer unnecessarily because they know that they have to pay an excess payment. So that is what we mean with excess payment. So we are done with insurance concepts. What is key is to know that we have five insurance concepts over and the insurance average loss reinstatement and excess. Then the difference now between insurance and assurance. What is the difference between the two? Insurance is based on the principle of indemnity, the principle of replacing, repaying someone who has lost uh, maybe their asset due to, to a specified loss or damage. But assurance is based on the principle of security or certainty. So this is now on the idea of securing the customer or the client for future to say if they get to retirement what would be uh, their security so they basically when you take assurance you want to be assured in the future to secure the future maybe uh, your future or the future of your dependents then insurance now the insured transfers the cost of potential loss to the insurer at a premium and then when you're looking into the insurer the insurer undertakes to pay an agreed the insurer, meaning the company, undertakes to pay and agree. They agree to say so will pay an agreed sum of money after a certain period has expired on the debt of the insured person or whichever that occurs first. So that is assurance. As I said, it secures money for the future, either for the dependence of the one who has taken the, 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 the assurance policy or for the dependents or for the, 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 the actual uh, insured one who maybe might retire to say when they get to retirement, they will be expecting an agreed upon sum of money. Then insurance will cover now a specified event that may occur. So insurance covers a specified event that may occur. It can be theft, it can be hijacked, maybe for a car, it can be a, a, a car accident. But when you're looking into assurance, uh, the specified event is certain. So the event is known, but the time of the event is not known. So when we're looking into this part, it focuses on what is being covered. So the event here is, is specified, but we don't know if it may occur or not. But with assurance, the event is certain. Events we are talking about here can be that or retirement. So hence we say specified events are certain, but the time are not um, the time of the event is not is uncertain. We don't know if it's gonna occur or will it not occur and when will it occur and then applicable. When is it applicable? It is applicable to short-term insurance. Remember, we talked about examples of short-term insurance to be your money in transit, theft, burglary, and fire. And then we also talked about long-term insurance. And the examples of that can be life insurance, endowment policies, or retirement annuities. And all those are now uh, insurances that allow one to get an agreed upon uh, money or sum of money on a future date. Then, examples of long-term and short-term with your long-term or with your short-term insurance, we're talking about property insurance, we're talking about theft, we're talking about burglary, we're also talking about fire. But when you're looking into long-term insurance, we're talking about endowment policy, life insurance, we're also talking about retirement annuities, pension fund or provident fund together with disability policies. Then, Principles of insurance. Now we talk about principles of insurance. We have four principles. The first one is the principle of indemnity. We also have the principle of securities or certainty and the principle of utmost good faith together with the principle of insurable interest. Now let's explain these principles. Remember when we were looking at the difference between insurance and assurance, we established that uh, insurance is based on the principle of indemnity while assurance is based on the principle of security wise because uh, indemnity indems, uh, indemnifies one in if the asset is lost or damaged but security secures the future now of the uh, uh, insured person in a case of maybe retirement or uh, that and then the dependents would be secured for the future 
but we'll also talk about utmost good faith and insurable interest which now are principles as well which are important in b2 to, to consider before you take insurance so we'll start with the first one which is the principle of indemnification or indemnity now Usually, it is, it is applicable to short-term insurance as the insured is compensated for a specified or proven harm or loss. So, that is your indemnification. It talks about compensating. What do we mean by compensating? We mean maybe to repay. We mean to repay. So, that is your compensation. So, the indemnification focuses on short-term insurance, which can now, your examples can be fire. It can be theft. So, meaning now, the short-term insurance examples are your fire and theft. So, if it happens that fire and theft happens to a business, the insured will be compensated, meaning they'll be repaid maybe to replace the stock that might be lost due to theft or fire. So, they would be paid to repay for a specified proven harm or loss. So, maybe the insurance company or the insured has proven or as a business they say we want to be covered for fire and we also want to be covered for theft then as we proceed the insurer would agree or agrees to compensate the insured for damages or losses specified in the insurance contract in return for premiums paid by the insured to the insurer so they agree to what now to compet to compensate meaning to repay the what the insured for the proven what losses that are specified in the contract the losses can be fire or theft in return what do you pay as an as the insured or as the business so that you get covered from your fire and theft you need to pay a premium so that you transfer the risk to the insurance company and then it protects now the insured against the specified events that may occur remember fire and theft are those uh, specified events so the insurance company would be receiving premium in a form of money so that they cover any uh, from a specified event like a car accident like fire and theft so that is the principle of indemnity it talks about the idea that the insured will be compensated or will be repaid in a case of any proven loss or specified loss if it occurs then security what does that principle uh, principle look into? The principle looks into now the idea of long-term insurance, meaning it is applicable to long-term insurance, whereby the insurer undertakes to pay out an agreed upon amount in an event of loss of life. So the first aspect we should know that uh, long-term insurance covers um, someone's life which can be an event that may occur there can be that or it looks into retirement a retirement and then a predetermined amount would be what paid out so what do we mean when we say predetermined amount so we are saying if you take insurance today you would be saying i'm taking life cover or life insurance for one million did you die today no you didn't die to say today so what we are basically saying is a predetermined amount will be paid out when the insured reaches a predetermined age so that now talks to what re 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 retirement so retirement would say now today maybe you might be 30 so you are basically saying when you are 65 you want to receive 1 million hence we say a predetermined when was it determined the amount was determined when you were 1 million uh, when you were 30 to say now when you are 65 you will get 1 million sorry for that so because you can't be 1 million so the amount was determined hence we are previously determined when you were 30 to say when you are 65 you will be paid out by the insured uh, uh, when you reach a predetermined age, which might be 65. So that's what we mean. And then 
the aim is to provide financial security. So this 1 million now would provide financial security to the insured at retirement or the dependents of the deceased. So it means now your kids, if it happens that you pass away, would use the 1 million so that they are secured and they are able now to provide for their needs and wants. So it provides protection now. If it happens that the dad or the mom passes away, the kids would be secured. They would be able to pay maybe for the services of the house and they would also be able to buy food for themselves. So hence we say it provides financial security. Hence it is predetermined and hence it is a large amount of money then we have the principle of utmost good faith the principle of utmost good faith it focuses on being honest is the principle that focuses on being honest when you're entering into an insurance contract so the insured has to be honest in supplying details when entering in an insurance what contract now that's what this focuses on so the insured has to be honest so basically this would occur maybe when you are entering into an insurance contract let's say maybe you recently bought a car and you have to specify where you are staying because where you are staying determines the risk of losing the car and also where you 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 park uh, also determines how safe is the car and how much risk is associated with that particular car so when they're saying the insured has to be honest in supplying details when entering in an insurance contract this now helps the, the the insurance company to calculate the risk associated with your asset so the insurance company would ask you where do you park your car at night for instance where do you park your car at night they would also ask you where do you park your car uh, uh, during the day during the day so they would ask if uh, is there any locked is it parked in a locked garage maybe and then they would ask if your workplace does it have maybe security access they would also ask if you are the regular driver so all those aspects determine the risk because if now a car is parked at night in a locked garage it means this car has less risk compared maybe to a car that might be parked in a yard with no gate so they would ask such questions so when they ask such questions you should be able to supply honest information which will help to determine the risk associated with your car and then both the insurer and the insured must disclose all relevant facts as we are saying because they would have to come and check if you do have a locked garage where you stay and then the insured must disclose everything that may affect the extent of risk so the insured must disclose everything such as maybe is it in a locked garage or not do you have security access or not do you have car tracker or not because car tracker will also help to recover the car if it is maybe stolen so information supplied when claiming should also be accurate and true so this focuses on whether when you're entering into an insurance contract you are telling the truth or not so when it comes to supplying information when you are claiming you should be asked to say what time was the accident so they would ask you what time was the accident so you should be honest when they're asking you about the time maybe they would ask you where you drank so those are questions when it comes to claiming so all those questions should be answered and when you answer you should be honest so that and you should be accurate and tell the truth that would show that you are now uh, being utmost good faith and you are telling the truth so that is what we mean with utmost good faith to say when you enter into an insurance contract become honest because the information determines the risk and the insured must disclose everything that may affect the extent of risk so that the premium can be calculated the premium can be uh, calculated and a proper premium can be calculated for that matter insurable interest is also another principle and this is our last principle now the insured must prove that he or she will suffer financial loss if the insured object is damaged or lost or ceased to exist so basically they are saying here if maybe you own a car then your car you have maybe borrowed money 
you have borrowed money to pay the car and you are still paying maybe installments. You are paying installments. So if you are paying installments, this means maybe you are paying for six years. So when you are taking insurance, you should prove that you should prove that I'm taking this insurance or I'm interested in this insurance. I'm interested in this insurance because if my car is to be stolen, I will still have to pay insurance for the next six years. So hence, I'm saying I am interested in insurance. Hence, we say insurable interest. So you should now, the insured must prove that he or she will suffer financial loss if the insurance short object is damaged lost or ceases to exist and then an insurable interest must be expressed in financial terms so this should be expressed in financial terms as i said the installments for six years they lead to a value being paid to say maybe the car was two hundred thousand but the loan amount together with the interest now would be maybe 350000 at the end of six years. So if I am to lose this car and not have cover, I will still have to pay 350000 which now is to prove that I stand to lose financially if the object that I want to insure is damaged or lost. So that has to be expressed in financial terms. And then the insured must have a legal relationship with the insured object in the in the form of a contract so that they prove that then now there's evidence that you own the car or there's evidence that there is ma an, an agreement or there is ownership of that particular car. So, so that you explain that I stand to lose financially. Then we have now advantages of insurance what are the advantages of insurance to the business one it transfers the what the risk from the insured to the insurance company so that is the first part it protects or it transfers the risk from the insured to the so it means the business would be transferring the risk to the insurance company furthermore the transfer of risk is subjected to terms and conditions of the insurance contract and also considers the principles, the insurance concepts that we talked about, and it protects the business against your dishonest employees and it protects the business against losses due to that of a debtor. If there's someone owing you, you can insure them and when they're insured, you know that they would be covered and then. It protects the business against theft or loss of stock caused by natural disasters. So, hence you can see the umbrella would cover would come as an insurance which now protects the asset of the business that can be uh, maybe caused by natural disasters. And then business assets such as vehicles, equipment, and buildings need to be insured against any damage or theft. So it talks to that idea, but it also protects the stock of the business from theft and law, uh, that can be caused by natural disasters. Remember, uh, recently KZN was now uh, faced with a, a lot of flooding, which led to some businesses losing their assets due to that natural disaster. Then. Replacement cost for damages or machinery or equipment is very high. Therefore, the insurance can reduce or cover such costs. So the meaning of insurable and non-insurable interest. So here we are talking about the risks that can be insured. Hence, we say insurable and non-insurable risks. What do we mean by insurable risks? These risks that are these are risks that are insured by the insurance company. The insurance company decides on the likelihood of the event, then decide if they want to insure the risk or not. While non-insurable risks, these are risks that are not insured by the insurance companies as the insurance costs are too high. Then the insurance company cannot calculate the profitability of the risk. Therefore, they cannot work out a premium that the business must pay. So that's what we mean. Then examples of those insurable risks, the business can cover theft, the business would cover fire, burglary and natural disasters such as storms and rains and maybe damage to loss of assets or vehicle or equipment or property. 
or buildings. So those are your fire, those are your burglary and natural disaster. But when it comes to non-insurable risks, change in fashion cannot be covered, change in technology cannot be covered, irrecoverable debts cannot be covered, shoplifting during business hours cannot be covered and possible failure of a business can also not be covered now the meaning of compulsory insurance now we are done with non-compulsory after insurable and non-insurable risks we look now into your compulsory insurance compulsory insurance this is insurance that is required by the law before the businesses may engage in certain activities so it is required it's compulsory by the law you need to have that insurance it is intended to safeguard the welfare of everyone concerned especially the workers inside the business that is why it is really really important furthermore it is regulated by the government and does not require insurance contracts or brokers so basically compliance is done via the government and remember it is required by the law differences now between compulsory and non-compulsory insurance is that compulsory insurance is required by the law and there are legal obligations for it to be taken out and paid for while non-compulsory is voluntary and the insured has a choice whether to enter into an insurance contract or not and it is regulated by the government and does not require insurance contracts so it means it is done or the compliance is done via the government while when we're looking into non-compulsory which now can apply to individuals to say the insured will enter into a legal uh, a contract with the insurer who may be represented by the insurance broker then when you're looking into ways of paying this too compulsory payment in a form of levies or contributions are paid into a common fund which benefits um, from which benefits may be claimed under certain conditions. While we are looking into non-compulsory annual or monthly payments or premiums that must be paid in order to enjoy cover for nominated risks. And then when we look into examples of companies or ways in which a business can do those is your UIF, your road accident fund, your compensation for occupational injuries and disease act or your compensation fund. And those are basically ways in which a business would have to comply. And when you can look into compulsory, it requires businesses to comply than any other thing. And then non-compulsory, it applies to individuals, to individuals. Because remember we said uh, your, 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 your compulsory insurance, it, it focuses on the business before they can start engaging in the activities, they need to maybe comply with compensation fund to make sure that they pay the levies to ensure that workers are protected. And then you also have UIF, which focuses on making sure that when employees are unemployed, they can be able to get some relief while they are still looking for a job. But non-compulsory now, your examples can be short term, which covers theft, fire and etc so if you decide that you are safe and you know that your car won't be stolen you don't it's not compulsory for you to join your uh, uh, insurance and then long term is not compulsory for one to take life insurance it depends hence we say it applies mostly to individuals while compulsory applies to businesses then compulsory insurance we have three types we have unemployment insurance fund we have road accident fund and we have compensation for occupational injuries and disease act then when we look into unemployment insurance fund the uif provides benefits to workers who have been working and become unemployed for various reasons remember during covid 19 a lot of people lost their jobs and they didn't plan to lose those jobs it was due to covid 19 and the restrictions that were there then Employees contribute 1% of their basic wage to the UIF, while as well the business contributes 1% of their basic wage towards the fund, which is UIF, Unemployment Insurance Fund. All employees who work at least 24 hours per month are required to register for your Unemployment Insurance Fund and contribute towards the fund. And then businesses are required to register their employees with the fund and to pay contributions to the fund. So that is your Unemployment Insurance Fund. So it is applicable to people who are looking for jobs. And then with Unemployment Insurance Fund, there are benefits. So types of Unemployment Insurance benefits include your unemployment benefit. When you are unemployed, you can claim 
when you are ill, you can claim. When you are pregnant, you can claim when you are during maternity leave. You can also claim when you are uh, trying to do adoption and claim when you have dependence benefit, which applies to now uh, 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 the kids of someone who has passed away. Then we we'll look into the first one, unemployment benefits. Employees who become unemployed or retrenched due to restructuring and uh, uh, or maybe their contract has expired may claim within six months after becoming unemployed and no tax is payable on the benefits which we call unemployment benefit so these are the conditions at which one can claim from the fund however they can also claim when they are ill ill benefits when they are sick and when they have disability employees may receive these benefits if they are unable to work for more than 14 days without receiving a salary or part of their salary so employees may not claim these benefits if they refuse medical treatment though so that is the requirement for one to get uh, uh, illness benefits but then when you look into maternity maternity pregnant employees receive these benefits for up to four consecutive months and then if an employee had a miscarriage she can claim for up to six weeks or 42 days and then when we are looking into adoption employees may receive these benefits if they adopt a child younger than two years and then another one employees who take unpaid leave may claim for uif while caring for the child at home so that is adoption because one the process of adopting now one has to make sure that the child is familiar with him or her so hence now they will not be able to go to work so in the process of all that they can claim from the unemployment insurance fund benefit and then dependence benefit dependents may apply for these benefits if the breadwinner who has contributed to the uif dies so that is your dependence and the dependents of the deceased may claim whether they are employed or not then we also have temporary employer or employee relief scheme this was developed due to covid 19 so all employers or employees who are registered with the department of employment and labor can apply for this relief remember some businesses were operate were not operating during covid 19 meaning they were not able to make profit and pay workers so they had to apply for temporary employer or employee relief scheme the scheme applies to employers who cannot pay their workers or employees who will not be getting paid during the period of the lockdown so this was for the lockdown and this also applies to employees who have been forced to take leaves as a result of coronavirus outbreaks then we look into road accident fund they will be focusing on explanations of the road accident fund or the road benefit scheme the road accident fund or the road accident benefit scheme ensures road users against negligence of other road users which leads now to accidents and then the road accident fund is funded by the levy on the sale of petrol or diesel so we are basically saying that whenever someone is buying petrol uh, there's a levy or there's a, a, a contribution that goes to road accident fund and the next of kin of workers or breadwinners who are injured or killed in a road accident uh, can or may claim directly from the road accident fund or road accident benefit scheme then the injured parties and the negligent drivers are both covered by the road accident fund then this can occur when there's a car accident and there's someone who who, who who get killed or injured while they're driving because some of the injuries lead to one not being able to work then when we're looking into compensation for occupational injuries and disease act this fund covers occupational diseases and workplace injuries one and then the, it compensates again employees for being injured or who catch disease or who incur diseases while they are at work. Then this fund covers employers for any legal claims that workers may bring against them. And then the employers are responsible for contributing, meaning they are responsible for paying towards the fund and may not claim money back from employees or deduct contribution from the wages of the employee and then in an event of a death of the employee as a result of work related accident the, the or disease his or her dependents may receive financial support so 
that is your compensation for occupational injuries and disease act so so far we have looked into the three let us now look into typical exam questions so i'll show you these questions and then you will try to answer we have 2.1 give examples of short-term insurance for four marks remember we talked about that short-term long-term insurance examples of that and then 2.2.2 uh, read the scenarios below and answer questions that follow you have lucky traders who bought stock that is worth 400,000 but is insured it for 300,000 now what is the situation there what is key to understand what is the value of the stock the value of the stock is 400,000 and like he now has insured the stock for 300,000 so the value is over or the value is under the insurance amount so that is considered to be under insurance and then a fire in the warehouse destroyed the stock to the value of 60,000 so name the insurance concept applicable in the scenario above and name the average law or name the insurance clause that is applicable to the scenario above remember i said we have situations and we have ways in which we deal with those situations then 2.3 distinguish between insurance and assurance for eight marks so when we are looking into the answers remember short term we are looking into theft we're looking into theft we're looking into fire we're looking into property insurance property insurance and so forth but then when you're looking into this one according to my thinking the answer here should be under insurance under insurance why under insurance because the insured amount is 300,000, but the value of the stock is 400, meaning there is under insurance there that occurs. Then which insurance clause is to be applicable there? The insurance clause should be average clause. And then distinguish between the two insurance is based on the principle. The first part is to think about the principles applicable there. The principles, the first one is the principle of uh, indemnity. The other one is the principle of security. The other one covers an event that may occur. A specified event that may occur. The other one, the event is certain. The event is certain. but the time is uncertain so that is your secure part when you are looking now into the solutions to prove all that property insurance one theft fire and burglary are your examples of short-term insurance and you get zero four then name the insurance concepts applicable there under insurance as i said how much was the value of stock the value of stock was 400,000, but the insurance amount was 300,000. so you see that that is under insurance it is under 400,000. then we have 2.2.2 name the insurance clause that is applicable there what is the insurance clause average clause two marks for that then two marks for that and then maybe in an exam they can ask you to to calculate now the average loss you should know that the formula is amount in short over value of the item in short multiply by the damages then you should you should know that and then when we are looking now into that scenario remember the value of the stock was four hundred thousand and the amount was three hundred thousand and then maybe you would be required to tell what are the damages and the damages were sixty thousand so you have to say now what was the amount in short it was three hundred thousand over four hundred thousand multiplied by sixty thousand and calculate to say how much would that lead to so you have to say three hundred thousand divided by 
300,000 divided by 400,000 multiplied by 60,000. Then the answer there would be the amount or that the insurance would pay would be 45,000 for that situation. So if it happens now, the question says calculate the amount of insurance that would be paid out for the situation. So always remember the market value or the value of the item should be under the insurance amount and the item has value should be more than the amount insured multiplied by the damage and then you'd get the proper answer. And remember again, your answer should always be under the amount of damages. Then as we proceed, distinguish between insurance and assurance. Insurance is based on the principle of indemnity, while assurance is based on the principle of security or certainty. And then the insurance now, the insured amount or the insured transfers the cost of potential loss to the uh, insurer at the premium. And then the insurer undertakes to pay certain or an agreed upon amount of money after a period uh, or has expired or on the death of the insured person, whichever that occurs first. And then it covers a specified event that may occur. However, here the specified event is certain, but the time of the event is uncertain. So that is how you get your eight out of eight and then if they say specify again your applicable is applicable to short term while the other one to long term just be aware that these short responses sometimes can give you one mark instead of two so just be aware of that and try to add more points and then examples as well they would be counting there and then you would get eight out of eight and then another typical now uh typical uh, uh, question we have is to read the scenario below and answer questions that follow we have total properties total properties is insured uh, or total properties has insured uh, against fire and theft and garabo the owner signed an insurance contract with t d g insurers and garabo was informed that she will be compensated only if her property gets damaged by fire and theft and then garabo disclosed everything that may affect the extent of risk so you are required now 2.4.1 identify two principles of insurance that are applicable to the scenario above and motivate your answer by quoting from the scenario. So we go back. Garabo, the owner signed a what? An insurance contract with TGD. There's no answer there. There's no answer there. It just tells you what Garabo did. But the answer now starts here. Garabo informed was informed that she will only be compensated when property gets damaged by fire and theft. So you should know that what is fire and theft? These are the examples of short term, short term insurance. And then Garabo disclosed everything that may affect the extent of risk. Now, this talks to the which principle now? This principle, the principle of the idea that Garabo was honest here. It talks to a principle. So, identify the two principles. So, I'm helping you to be able to identify, to say Garabo disclosed everything, meaning Garabo is honest. So, two principles there that are applicable and then explain other two principles. So, the principles applicable there becomes the principle of indemnity. Why? Because Garabo will only be compensated for fire and theft, which falls under short-term insurance. So since they fall under short-term, then they are categorized as now what indemnity, because remember, indemnity says it is applicable to short-term insurance. So just keep that in mind. Be aware of such. And then utmost good faith, Garabo disclosed everything, which means Garabo is honest when entering into an insurance contract. So that's one and two marks for that then you get six. Then other types, principle of insurance, six marks, two marks for just saying principle of security and explaining would just give you one mark and then we proceed. And then this is considered to be maximum. Then insurable interest, two marks, and then specifying what it is would give you one mark. And then this would, this is how you'd be marked during section, during section B. And this is max. Then we look into another assessment, typical exam question. Read the scenario or statements below and answer questions that follow. Johannesburg traders took insurance against theft 
damage, fire and burglary due to high criminal activities and strikes in the surrounding areas. 2.5.1 quote three examples of insurable risk from the scenario above and explain the meaning of non-insurable risk. Discuss the importance of insurance when you are looking into it. Which aspects now are the examples there? Theft, damage, fire and what? Burglary. Those are your examples and then explain the meaning of non-insurable interest. When we look into insurable risks as theft, as damage, fire and burglary. But then damage cannot be considered. So you see, damage is used to make you confused. The only three that are applicable is theft, fire and burglary. And then what is the meaning? The risks that are not insured for by the insurance company are considered to be non-insurable because these in, uh, costs are too high for the insurance to cover. And then the insurance company cannot now, the insurance company cannot calculate the profitability of the risk and therefore they cannot work out the premium to be paid by the business. Then the importance of insurance, it transfers the risk from the insured to the insurance company. Then another one, it transfer the risk of the, uh, uh, the, the, the transfer of risk is subjected to terms and conditions of the insurance contract. Too much for that. It protects the business against dishonest employees and then it protects the business against losses due to debt of a debtor. Then it protects the business against theft or loss of stock caused by natural disasters. And that is eight already. So that is how you get your eight. And then we have another typical exam question. Identify the types of insurance applicable to each statement below. Gladi will receive compensation for losing her job due to restructuring of the company and Levy will be compensated for serious injuries he sustained in a taxi accident on his way to work. To discuss three types of benefits covered by the unemployment insurance fund for nine marks. So what are the solutions there? When you're looking into the issue of Tladi, Tladi losing her job, meaning now due to restructuring, meaning Tladi is unemployed. So the compulsory insurance there that would be applicable is your unemployment insurance fund, two marks. Then when Levy got now in a car accident, that is considered to be compensation for occupational injuries and disease. So that is how you get your four marks. Then the benefits now, we have unemployment, two marks for that and one mark for when you explain, then this is considered to be max because sub max would be three for each. Then two marks there and one mark for the explanation, which is your illness max there because you already received the three then you also have maternity two marks one mark for the proper response or explanation then you have your max then then you get your three so that is how you'd get your nine that is how we mark during the section b Then that's how you get your nine. And then summary of our lesson, we looked into elaborating on the meaning of non-compulsory insurance, explaining the meaning of insurance, explaining the differences between over and under insurance, then differentiating between insurance and assurance, and naming or giving examples of short-term and long-term insurance. Then we also looked into insurance concepts over, under insurance, average loss and reinstatement together with excess. And then we also looked into the principle of insurance, which is your indemnity, your security, your certainty. And we also looked into utmost good faith and insurable interest. Then we looked into the advantages of insurance or importance of insurance, explaining the meaning of insurable and non-insurable risks. We also looked into outlining or giving examples of insurable and non-insurable risks and proceeded by looking into types of compulsory insurance which is your unemployment insurance fund road accident fund together with compensation for occupational injuries and disease act 
and looked into types of unemployment insurance benefits, your unemployment benefits, your illness benefit, your maternity benefit, together with adoption benefits and dependence benefits. So that is the end of our lesson. Thank you for watching.